All right, today we're going to talk about chapter two, biological psychology. This chapter basically deals with several parts, including neurons, parts of the neuron, neurocommunication, the nervous systems, and the parts of the brain. All of which, why this chapter is early in the course is because the brain, everything that's psychology is everything that's biology. So how a person functions in terms of biologically will affect them psychologically as well. Now, in terms of, there's two basic types of cells that we have. Neurons are cells that process incoming signals and respond to sending signals out to other neurons. They're basically the basic building blocks of the brain. The other type of cell are glia cells. And these are cells that aid in the transferring of a signal and keep the basic structures of the nervous system intact. Primarily, they are necessary for neurons to function. They are simply like the helping cells that provide neurons the ability to be able to communicate throughout our brain and our body. Now, in terms of the parts of the neuron, you have several distinct parts. Dendrites are the receiving part of the neuron. They receive the message from other neurons. The nucleus is the centerpiece of a neuron that contains DNA, which basically determines how the cell is going to fire which is critical when we talk about in terms of action potentials and the process of how that occurs. The soma is the cell body encasing, and this encases the nucleus that provide, produces neurotransmitter substances, which when we talk about neurotransmitters are chemical messengers. Now, the axon hillock is basically like a gate, and that gate is simply going to be open or closed, which determines whether or not information is going to go down the axon. The axon is like a neural tube, kind of like a slide in a water park. And that sends information from the soma to the end part of the neuron, which this is basically simply put, the sending part of the neuron. Now, myelin sheath is simply what encases the axon, and it protects and speeds up the transmission within the axon. Now, the key thing that you always have to remember with myelin sheath, and you often see this on tests, is that depletion of myelin sheath is what leads to multiple sclerosis. And multiple sclerosis affects people in terms of their movement as well as their cognition or cognitive abilities. Now, the nodes of brain fear are gaps within the myelin sheet, myelin sheet that speed up the transmission. Okay? Now, just to kind of go through this again, because this is obviously you have to know the parts before I move on. Dendrites, I always kind of teach you like this. It's like DR, like a doctor receives patients. Dendrites receives information. The nucleus is the centerpiece that in case of the DNA, that simply is going to be how they're different, how every neuron is different because of the way it fires. This is located within the nucleus. The soma is the encasing of the nucleus, and this is important because it produces neurotransmitter substance, which you'll learn is simply the chemical messengers that travel. Axon hillock is like the gate, all right, that the gate that determines whether or not information will go down the axon. The axon is a neural tube where information travels, the sending part of the neuron. And again, myelin sheath, which often is like, if you want to picture a cord, is the plastic around the wire. It encases the wire, it encases the axon, which often is going to affect the speed as well as the efficiency of the transmission. And again, if myelin sheath depletes, you can have multiple sclerosis. Now, typical question from that page, and often you'll see this on the test, the deterioration of myelin causing leakage of electrical activity within the axon has been associated with which of the neurological disorders? A. Parkinson's, B. Alzheimer's, C. Muscular dystrophy, D. Multiple sclerosis, or E. e Huntington disease. And I think most of you remember the answer was multiple sclerosis. Now, other parts of the neuron. The axon terminal is the ending part of the neuron that releases information very much like a terminal at an airport, okay, where the plane leaves the gate. Now, the synapse or synaptic cleft is the gap between neurons. Okay, this is what separates the dendrites of one neuron from the axon of another neuron. Now, neurotransmitters, like I alluded to before, are the chemical messengers that are released into the synapse. These neurotransmitters have a specific design or a purpose, and they have also a specific site that they're going to, which basically what they're searching for is where they're going to bind best to. All right? Really, the kind of way you look at this is a neurotransmitter is like a key that's going to go to an appropriate lock. Okay? As only one key opens up a lock, 
The same thing as neurotransmitters are designed to fit on specific receptor sites. Now, the neurotransmitters that don't bind are often what I like to refer to vacuumed back up. Now, this vacuuming up process is referred to as the reuptake process. So it's always like somebody that cleans up, okay, the food that people don't eat at the table and then just simply puts it away as leftovers. So really, what this is, is neurotransmitters not used are considered leftovers, and they will be reused at some other point. Now, you have two types of neurons, okay? Sensory or afferent neurons are neurons that are designed specifically to transmit information from the spinal cord to the brain. They simply send information, okay, from the environment. In other words, when you touch something, see something, you know, hold something, that sensation is being sent through a sensory neuron to the spinal cord, eventually to the brain to be processed. Now in return, afferent or motor neurons are neurons that trans information outward, outward from the spinal cord to certain muscles and glands, which obviously motor neurons are responsible for movement. Now, obviously you, you see afferent sensory neurons, afferent motor neurons. A lot of times people get those confused. Just remember the word same. Same as S for sensory, A for afferent, M for motor, E for afferent. Okay, the same neuron. So basically, if you remember like that with the word same, that will help you with that. Now, in terms of neurocommunication, and this is the second part of this chapter, in order for us to communicate between our brain and our body, there has to be messages sent from one neuron to the next. So in other words, what this part is about is what causes a neurotransmitter to be released into the synapse. Now, this relies on a neural impulse, which eventually you'll learn is called an action potential. First of all, every neuron is at a polarization type of charge. And what this means is every neuron is negatively charged on the inside, within the axon. We call this the resting potential. The resting potential is simply when negatively charged ions wait for stimulation within the axon. So they're at a resting period. So the main connection you have to make is when a neuron is doing nothing, it's at a resting potential. And this is called a state of polarization. In other words, it's a negative charge. Now, what happens when a message lands on the dendrites from another neuron, it causes the process of depolarization. Depolarization is simply the charge is starting to become positive. I always tell you, remember, the PO in polarization, D positive, it's starting to become positive. It's determining positive. That's how I always will have you remember this. When it becomes positive on the inside, the inside of the axon, in other words, sodium and potassium ions start to enter, what this is going to cause <coughs> is an action potential, which is a neural impulse. This is a change in the balance of the overall charge from negative to positive. What this allows, what an action potential allows, this is the main thing, is it allows the message to send down the axon. Action potential is like a push. It pushes the message down the axon. And again, to back it up, why did this push you know, simply begin? It's because the inside of the cell, inside of the axon, became positive through the process of depolarization. Now, threshold is a common term you're going to use connect with this process. Threshold is a, a, like a line, all right? It's a point of excitation that has to be met or it has to be exceeded. So in other words, think of it this way. If this is a threshold, this line, as the inside of the cell is becoming positive through the process of depolarization, okay, it's determining positive, as it simply pushes this line up or exceeds this line, this right here, threshold, is simply once it's exceeded, it will launch, it will fire an action potential. So in other words, once the gate is open, okay, or once the line is crossed, in other words, that push, which we call an action potential, will send the message down the axon. Now, after an action potential occurs, in other words, after a neuron fires, after that push occurs and the message goes down the axon, what happens is the neuron goes into a state of refractory period. Refractory period is the time period after an action potential occurs that simply the neuron cannot fire. It's in a state of refractory. In other words, what happens is, until that charge gets back to the period of polarization, remember polarization is the negative charge, 
until I get back, back to that original negative 70 resting potential, okay, it cannot fire another action potential. Now, I often use this in class to explain. This is like simply when you flush a toilet. You have to wait for the water to reach back up to its original point before you can flush that toilet again. It's the same idea here. Until that charge gets back to its original polarization of negative 70, which is signified as a resting potential, it cannot fire another action potential. The other thing to kind of point out is the all or none response. The all or none response is there's no half or so to speak slight or variation of an action potential. And it either fires at full strength or it doesn't fire at all. I always use the all or none response, like pulling the trigger of a shotgun. The bullet is going to fly out the same way every single time. It doesn't fly out one way, you know, partially and then another way, a little bit more. It comes, the bullet comes out of the gun the same way. <clears throat> that is the all or none response. Either the neuron fires or it does not fire. Now, common question, the fact that a neuron either fires at full strength or does not fire at all is the result of which of the following, which we obviously just went over. Is that called depolarization? All or nothing principle? Level of excitation? Refractory area? Or accident hill lock process? And most of you probably chose the all or nothing principle, which is the correct answer. Either the neuron fires or it does not fire. Now, neurotransmitters, like I said earlier, are chemical messengers that are specifically designed to carry a certain message that are responsible for certain things that you experience within your brain or within your body. Every neurotransmitter has a role. Now, like I said, they're chemicals that are produced by the body and they transfer signals from neuron to neuron. Now, they're involved from everything from moving your arm to generating a thought to experiencing an emotion. Now, this chart right here is pretty much your standard neurotransmitters, your most typical, I should say. You'll see these scattered throughout the book, okay? But I do want to mention them here because in really where I want you to understand neurotransmitters is in the terms of excess or deficiency. Now, acetylcholine is involved in memory, mood, voluntary muscle movement, okay? Acetylcholine is basically you're able to move your arms voluntarily. Now, excessive, if you obviously have excessive acetylcholine, it's going to cause convulsions, which is involuntary shaking, or you know, like I said, excessive shaking of your arms or legs. Deficiency is people that experience Alzheimer's disease show a deterioration of acetylcholine. Acetylcholine is central, okay, for people that experience Alzheimer's. And a lot of the medication is simply to, is studying how to improve or simply make acetylcholine last longer in a person's brain. Now dopamine is simply feelings of euphoria reward. When you feel good, dopamine is being released. Okay? Now you're going to see when we talk about abnormal psych, excessive dopamine within your system leads to, could lead to schizophrenia. A lack of dopamine can lead to Parkinson's disease, which probably one of the more well-known people that has Parkinson's is Michael J. Fox. Michael J. Fox, one of the symptoms of Parkinson's is the shaking of his hands, which is often involuntary. In other words, he doesn't have control over that. Now, a good way to remember kind of what that is, is kind of a little cliche, which might not be the best to say, but people that have excess dope experience schizophrenia, and people that run low on dope, okay, experience Parkinson's. Now, serotonin is a mood stabilizer. It's involved in mood consistency, right? So your moods are not really all over the place. And so I always kind of explain this. When Sarah is, is, when Sarah is present at a party, everyone is happy. In other words, everyone is calm or stable. In other words, Sarah makes sure that the party doesn't get out of control. Sarah also makes sure that nobody gets depressed at the party. Now, excessive serotonin you could lead to headaches and tremors, because it is. Obviously, it will elevate your moods, which too much excitation in the brain could cause headaches. However, when people run low on serotonin, or when Sarah's not there, 
people become depressed. It's also been connected with eating disorders, aggression, and alcoholism. GABA is involved not only in mood, but sleep and movement. Okay? And what happens is GABA is simply a type of drug that inhibits brain activity, slows down brain activity. So people that have excessive GABA, too much of GABA, are going to be very tired, lethargic, not have a lot of energy. People that have too much GABA, okay, or I'm sorry, people that do not have enough GABA, a deficiency in GABA, are going to experience anxiety orders, which obviously, if GABA slows down brain activity and they don't have enough GABA, they are going to experience, you know, very, very close symptoms to people that have with anxiety. Now, norepinephrine is involved with alertness. In other words, when norepinephrine gets released, you become wired, so to speak. You become very alert. Now, if you have too much norepinephrine, again, that's going to be connected with anxiety. That's going to also be connected with fear, okay? Which you'll realize when we talk about fight or flight, the sympathetic nervous system, norepinephrine, is a key ingredient being released. If people don't have enough of what makes you alert, then obviously the deficiency would account for depression. Now, glutamate, which is in charge of memory, okay? If people do not, or people have too much glutamate, it leads to brain damage or overstimulation. However, if they don't have enough, it could lead to certain neurological disorders. This is probably a slide that I would review or, or simply rewind because this is kind of where a lot of questions are going to come from when we have a test or when we have a quiz. For example, while running a marathon, Emily experienced an increase in the body's natural painkillers. Which of the following chemicals has been associated with pain? Now, I want to take this question to explain one neurotransmitter that wasn't on that chart. Now, the answer is letter D. Endorphins are basically the natural, the body's natural painkillers. In response to pain, when you experience pain, endorphins get released. And when endorphins get released, you simply, the pain gets cut down. Okay? Now, here's the thing. Depending on how much pain you feel is depending on how much endorphins get released. Now, another question that deals with neurotransmitters. Underproduction of blank has been associated with Alzheimer's disease. Whereas underproduction of blank has been associated with Parkinson's disease. Now this is obviously a typical question you can see on the test. Is it A, dopamine acetylcholine, B, serotonin GABA, C, acetylcholine dopamine, D, norepinephrine dopamine, E, acetylcholine serotonin. Now I'll help you out with this one. The answer is going to be letter C. Always line up A for acetylcholine with Alzheimer's. And remember, when people run out of dope, they often go to the park. Okay, and that's kind of, you know, a simpler way to understand it. Maybe not the best way, but a simpler way. And again, like I said, the answer is C. Now, another question on neurotransmitters. An excess of which neurotransmitter, again, too much neurotransmitter, has been associated with schizophrenia, while a deficiency of the same neurotransmitter has been associated with Parkinson's. Okay, so somewhat this is a similar question, but we throw in schizophrenia. And again, is it serotonin, melatonin, dopamine, GABA, and acetylcholine? Most of you just remember dopamine. When you run out of dope, you go to the park. When you have too much dope, you go crazy. So obviously, schizophrenia is connected with feelings of craziness or mental disorder. So the answer is an excessive neurotransmitter dopamine leads to schizophrenia and under or deficiency leads to Parkinson's. Now, the next part of this lecture deals with the nervous system. These neuro neurons have to go a place. They have to travel through something, is the best way to look at this. And what they travel through is our nervous system. Now, the two main nervous systems are the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system. Your brain and spinal cord is simply your central nervous system, okay, which is obviously critical because the spinal cord connects to the brain. Now, Nerves, which are simply bundles of axons. Remember, axons, okay, is what sends information. So information travels through nerves within the peripheral nervous system. Now, if you want to picture what a nerve looks like, it would literally look like rope, which is rope is just intertwined with string. So kind of to back this up, if you were to visually kind of look at this, your brain and your body, your brain and spinal cord are your central nervous system. Then what connects your body? to the central nervous system, in other words, your arms and your legs. 
is going to be your peripheral nervous system. Peripheral means out. All right? It's like peripheral vision is where you, what you see to the left and right. So if you're standing like this, this, what's out, which on this obviously is examples your arms, is connected to the central nervous system through the peripheral nervous system. The peripheral nervous system is like the name of a freeway. And the road on that freeway are what we call nerves. So neurons are traveling basically, the messengers are traveling through the nerves of the peripheral nervous system. Now, the peripheral nervous system is divided into two sub-nervous systems. The somatic nervous system is in charge of voluntary movements. Moving my arm, this is simply the work of the somatic nervous system. The other type of nervous system within the peripheral is called the autonomic nervous system. The autonomic nervous system is in charge, and here's the key word, involuntary movements. Now, what are involuntary movements? Well, look at this word, autonomic. Think about automatic. What is automatic within your body? Your heart rate, your breathing, digestion could be up there. These are happening, when I say involuntarily, these are happening without you doing anything. In other words, to voluntarily move your arms, you have to commit to that. You are making the movement. You're making a conscious effort to move your arm. That's somatic nervous system. The autonomic nervous system, you don't have to remind to do. You're not telling yourself, all right, heart, start to pump. You're not saying, all right, lungs, start to breathe. They're happening automatically. Now, there is two divisions of the autonomic nervous system. So ask yourself this. Obviously, certain parts of the day, your breathing accelerates, your heart rate accelerates. When that happens, that's the work of the sympathetic nervous system. When you get simply excited or pumped up, or, you know, whatever word you want to use. That is the sympathetic nervous system. S in sympathetic stands for speeding up. Parasympathetic nervous system calms you down. So after your heart races, after you get all excited, when you come down to simply, you know, your energy starts to deplete and you start to go back to how you felt before you got excited, that's the parasympathetic nervous system. One example that I remember always being taught to remember this is think of parasympathetic, parasympathetic nervous system like a parachute. A parachute slows you down as you fall to the ground. Parasympathetic nervous system slows your body down. It returns your heart rate back to its natural beat before the sympathetic nervous system kicked in. So again, just to go you know, over this, central nervous system, brain and spinal cord. What connects to the brain and spinal cord? The peripheral nervous system. Now again, in the peripheral nervous system, you have things that are voluntary, which is your somatic nervous system, and you have things that happen on their own, automatically, so to speak. You have certain things within the autonomic nervous system, like your heart rate, digestion, that speeds up, that's the sympathetic, and then finally calms down or returns back to a regular beat, that's your parasympathetic. Now, which of the following results in activation of the sympathetic nervous system? Good question. Your palms are dry. Your mouth is wet with saliva. Your digestive system is processing food. Your heartbeat is elevated. Your respiration rate is lower. Now, remember, sympathetic, the S stood for speeds up. Which one of these questions is talking about speeding up? Most of you have already figured it out. The answer is D. The sympathetic nervous system speeds up. Okay? Now, which of the following is an example of the functioning of the somatic nervous system? Okay, now again, remember, certain things happen automatically, certain things happen voluntarily. Dana just finished lunch and her digestive system is working to process the food. B, feelings of embarrassment caused by Alex's face to turn red. While he was running, Steve's heart rate increased. Alicia began to perspire when she thought about her upcoming test. Carly picked up her pencil after it had fallen to the floor. Which one of these, the way you look at this, happens voluntarily? Okay? Most of you are saying, you're looking at, at these right now, and it comes down to letter E. Okay? Carly voluntarily picked up her pencil. The somatic nervous system voluntarily allows things to happen. That's what it's in charge of. Now, the last part of this lecture dealing with the brain. Okay, the brain weighs about three pounds, and it's divided into two halves. 
okay, the left and the right. Now, Michael Kazanga studied how the brain displays lateralization. Lateralization is the tendency for one hemisphere to excel in performance over the other half. So you have always heard left brain, right brain. Now, your left hemisphere, and some of you dominate on this, so this is you know things that you would be very good at. If you're left brain dominant, you would be very good in terms of the use of language, logical analysis, which obviously is your math, and problem solving. Now your right hemisphere, for people that are right hemisphere dominant, you're very good at visual spa spatial tasks, imagination. You're able to recognize faces more so than you recognize people's names. You have creativity and often if you're right hemisphere dominant, your music ability is often a very good strength. Now, a lot of people are equal on both. Left and right brain simply are the same. Now, what connects the left and the right brain is the corpus callosum. Right, and it's neural tissue that connects the two hemispheres. It's kind of like phone wires, if you want to think of it like that. It allows the right and the left side of the brain to communicate back and forth, which obviously, you know, when I talk about this, the left side of the brain controls the right side of the body, and the right side of the brain controls the left side. So the corpus callosum is what allows this to happen. Now, Roger Spiri and Michael Gazenga studied split brain patients. And that's when the corpus callosum was severed. Now, some people experienced difficulties, especially when they were using their right eye and using their left arm or left hand to touch something. They often missed in terms of the direction they were trying to go in. Now, if you ask why the corpus callosum sometimes gets severed, it's often used because of people that experience epilepsy. People that have severe epilepsy, which is often overactivity in the brain, they feel if they cut the communication, they can slow down this overactivity. And it usually is kind of a last ditch effort. It's not something that's often used. Now, just to continue, after having his corpus callosum severed, probably because of epilepsy, one would most likely experience which of the following problems. Now remember, corpus callosum connects the two hemispheres. Right side of the brain controls left side of the body. Right side of the brain controls the left side of the body. Now, would he have an inability to form complete and coherent sentences, an inability to plan for future events, an inability to distinguish where a sound is coming from, an inability to control the smooth body movements, an inability to correct, correctly identify an object while holding it in one hand? Now, that's a really tricky question. But most of you, I think, got the right answer, which is letter E. They would have a hard time communicating between the right and left hemisphere. If Juan held something in his left hand, he would be unable to correctly state the name of the object. Information received by his left hand would be processed in the right hemisphere. If there's nothing there to connect it, the right and the left side, then obviously that's going to be a big problem. Now, human brains are divided into four distinct lobes. Each lobe has a function or a duty. Now, you have the frontal, the parietal, the occipital, and the temporal lobe. Now each lobe contains association areas. Association areas are like managers. They grab the information from multiple sources and then write a report. So that's like what a manager does. They have several people working for them. And then they get all the information and then they write an overall report. And that's what association areas do. Functional areas are areas of the brain that are specialized in the production of certain tasks or certain functions, okay, which when we get to, I'll give you some prime examples. Now, frontal lobe, which is in the front part of the brain, is responsible for controlling inhibitions. In other words, it's your impulse control, your temptation control. It's also in charge of short-term memory, reasoning, and planning. Now, damage to the frontal lobe could lead to excessive swearing, difficulty making decisions, in planning future events. So think about someone getting in trouble for saying something, or someone that comes up with the wrong answer. They can react like this and say, I'm so stupid, I shouldn't have said that. They hit the front part of their area, because that's in charge of simply your control. In other words, keeping you out of trouble, but also planning things and also making you know, decisions. This is why when people have concussions or you know, injuries to the front part of the brain, they often ask the person, to you know, plan or to simply go over how they got there. Because if there was damage to the frontal area, you would not be able to tell somebody the sequence of what it took to get from your house to wherever you were going. 
Now, parietal lobe, which is more of the top part of the brain, is responsible for receiving and combining tactile or touch. In other words, when you touch something, the parietal lobe basically processes that information. Damage to this area of the brain results in the ability to make sense out of your environment. In other words, what you sense in the environment, this is where perception takes place, where you understand what you're touching or tasting. Now think about, you know, probably a little bit at the top. People play tuck, tuck, duck, duck, goose where they tap the top part of the head. That's touch. Now, the occipital lobe is responsible for processing visual information, which is kind of right back in here, which is why when you get hit in the back of the head, you often get blurred vision. Now, it's also in charge of maintaining balance, which obviously is connected with vision. If you're dizzy and you can't see straight, you're not going to be able to walk straight. Now, damage could affect the ability to obviously move, identify colors, read and write words, everything. Just imagine, when you have blurred vision, all these things right here, you would have a hard time. Okay, we were talking about the lobes. On the previous slide, we covered the frontal lobe and the parietal lobe. And the frontal lobe was in charge of thinking, planning, you know, impulsivity, being able for people to keep in control. You know, the parietal lobe was in terms of touch, in terms of sensation. Now, talking about the other two lobes, the occipital lobe is in charge of visual, processing visual information. And a good way to remember the occipital lobe is, you know, O I can see or DOC. Obviously, DOC is a place where you get eyeglasses. But it's also involved in balance. So if there was damage to the occipital lobe, it would obviously affect your ability to move it would affect your ability to identify colors, read and write, uh, write words. The temporal lobe is responsible for processing auditory stimulation. And kind of a good way to remember that is like the tempo of a beat. Okay, to keep the tempo is to keep the beat. So you obviously have to hear the tempo. And obviously damage to the temporal lobe, somebody would have you know, a very difficult time understanding what people say. And also with the formation of memories, which most of our memories you know, rely on you know, auditory types of communication. Now, association areas, and remember we've talked about association areas. Association areas grab information from a variety of sources and then form it into meaningful statements or actions. Now, on the left hemisphere, which is important to understand, is where language you know, is basically being processed. The Wernicke's area is responsible for transforming spoken words into thoughts. Wernicke's area is our ability to understand what other people are saying or what we're reading. Now, damage can often result in what's called Wernicke's aphasia. Aphasia means an inability, an inability to perform, okay, a certain action or a thought. Now, this would obviously, Wernicke's aphasia would be an inability to understand spoken language or what is being said to that person. Broca's area, which again is on the left hemisphere, and that's primarily language, is responsible for transferring thoughts into spoken language. So Broca's area is in charge of basically our ability to speak to one another. Okay, our ability to simply communicate. Now, damage would result in what's called Broca's aphasia, inability to speak coherently. Where sometimes you will see Wernicke's aphasia or Broca's aphasia is if people experience a stroke, and the stroke happens to affect the left side of the brain. It is possible for some people to be able to talk, but not be able to understand and vice versa. Now, common question on this, a person who has lesions, and a lesion is something that destroys an area of the brain, okay, and this could be a tumor, this could be an infection, parasite, and so on, is having difficulty verbalizing complete or coherent sentences, okay, the key thing is verbalizing, all right, being able to speak complete or coherent sentences, this person most likely suffered damage to what part of the brain, Broca's area, Wernicke's area, motor cortex, auditory cortex, or so with the sensory cortex? And the answer was A, Broca's area. Now, Broca, I always try to have you remember it like broken speech, okay, or Boca means mouth in Spanish. It's a good way to remember that. Now, functional areas, and again, functional areas deal with a specific function, okay. The motor cortex is responsible for voluntary movements, and that's an example of a functional area. Now, it's located in the back of the frontal lobe. Damage can result in inability to voluntarily move parts of the body. You get bumped on the front part of the head. A lot of times your you know, motions are off and your balance is off as well. So much the sensory cortex is responsible for receiving sensory information. Now this is located at the front of the parietal lobe. And remember the parietal lobe is in charge of touch, so obviously that fits well into that area. Now damage can result in the loss of sensation of stimuli, and some people experience that. 
they're not able to taste anymore, they're not able to process visual or auditory information, and it is you know, something that affects this area. Now, the brain is divided into three parts. The hindbrain, the midbrain, and the forebrain. And the brain develops from the back to the front. The reason why it starts in the back is because if you look at the hindbrain, it's responsible for our basic light functioning. Okay, heartbeat, digestion, arousal, and balance. Damage to the hindbrain is, you know, often, you know, could lead to death because that's how vital it is. The midbrain sends signals from the hindbrain to the forebrain and it helps process information. So basically the role of the midbrain is to communicate between the hindbrain where all your survival mechanisms are and the forebrain, which is basically the last part of the brain form, but it's the most complex. It regulates emotions, hunger levels, formation of long-term memories, growth, hormones, and sense of smell. So the back is survival, and the front is how we simply you know, process information and we're able to express ourselves on a number of different levels. And the midbrain is basically situated between those two. Now, looking at this chart, and a lot of these areas of the brain we're going to go over in future chapters. So this chart is very much, you know, a, a very easy way to kind of remember this. But in terms of the hindbrain, okay, and the hindbrain is made up, you know, the medulla oblongata, which the medulla oblongata is in charge of respiration, heartbeat, and blood pressure. And again, it's located in the back of the brain. The pons relays information between the cerebellum and the cerebrum, the brain, okay? And a good way to remember the pons is, you know, the pons is like ping pong, going back and forth. It relays information between the cerebellum and the cerebrum. So the cerebrum is where you process thoughts. So just imagine someone playing ping pong, knocking the ball back and forth between the cerebellum and the cerebrum. Now, the reticular formation, or the reticular activating system, is in charge of alertness and arousal levels. Damage can result in a coma. So when people are in a coma, that's because the reticular formation was damaged. A good way to remember that reticular formation is in charge of alertness is simply, you know, I'll say it like this, pay particular reticular attention. Okay, it's a nice little rhyme for you. Cerebellum aids in balance and coordination of movement. A good way to remember that the cerebellum is in charge of balance is Sarah has good balance, or Sarah's balance. Okay? Brain stem, which is located right beneath the brain, is the lower part of the brain that connects to the spinal cord. Damage to the brain stem, obviously a lot of times can result in paralysis where you know, somebody is paralyzed from the neck down because this is a very exposed area. Now, the stridum, which is located in the midbrain, is control smooth body movements, walking a balance beam. This is you know, something that they often test with kids in kindergarten in terms of walking you know, one foot after another or walking on a balance beam to make sure that the stridum is you know, simply properly working. Often where this gets used again is when you have cursive or you're learning in second grade or first grade to you know, make you know, smooth letters. Now, common question here, Brittany's ability to maintain balance during a dance routine is due to the functioning of which areas of the brain? So again, when you kind of look at this, how, how I kind of taught it to you is Sarah has good balance. Okay, so which one of these basically has you know, Sarah's name in it? So temporal and frontal lobes, frontal and occipital lobes, cerebellum and temporal lobe, occipital and temporal lobe, and cerebellum and the occipital lobes. Now, obviously, this is more of a complex question. So which one of those lobes is in charge of vision? Because obviously, you have to see in order to be able to you know, perform certain type of movements. Now, if you relied on the DOC or OIPC example, then that should have pointed you to letter E. Okay, the cerebellum. Sarah has good balance, and you obviously need to see to be able to walk, so oh, I can see. People in the dark have a tendency to bump into things or, you know, remain off balance, and obviously the occipital lobe's not able to function properly. Now, in terms of the forebrain, remember the forebrain, the last to develop, that's where your complex thoughts, emotions are registered. This includes several brain structures. The thalamus, which is the relay sensory information to the appropriate area of the brain. The thalamus is like the secretary. In the, begin, in, the, you know, in the lobby of a building. She's basically going to instruct visitors what floors to go to in terms of who are the people they need to see. That's the same thing the thalamus does. It takes in, in you know, incoming sensory information and relays it to the proper area of the brain. The only thing the thalamus doesn't do is smell, which when we kind of talk about smell, that's why smell is usually one of the first senses to be registered because smell goes directly to the brain. It doesn't get relayed around as what the thalamus does. The hypothalamus, when you look at this one, you're going to see this come up in the hunger chapter as well as motivation. 
This re regulates hunger, thirst, fight or flight, our sex drive, body temperature, and maintaining homeostasis, which we'll talk about in another chapter. The hypothalamus is simply where our drives come from. Okay? Now, the amygdala, okay, again, in the forebrain, is associated with fear and aggression. And I always kind of remember this one. Don't make Amy mad. Okay, Amy has, you know, a terrible temper. Okay? Now the hippocampus is the formation of new explicit memories. And it also has the largest concentration of acidic colon, which damage to the hippocampus often could lead into Alzheimer's. If you remember from previous when we talked about the neurotransmitters, Alzheimer's is connected with acidic colon. Acidic colon is a neurotransmitter with movement. Now, when I say the formation of new explicit memories, we'll go over that in an upcoming chapter, but that is explicit memories are facts and figures, like your phone number. This is where information gets processed through. It's not necessarily where memories are stored. Okay? It's simply it has to go through the hippocampus in order for it to become a long-term memory. Now, again, damage to the hippocampus can lead to you know, amnesia. Now, the olfactory bulb, which literally looks like a bulb, which sits at the end of your nose up in the brain, is where smell is simply transmitted to. And when we talk about how drugs you know, have an effect on people, people that obviously do certain drugs where they inhale, they have an immediate effect because simply smell goes directly to the brain. Now, the pituitary gland is called the master gland. Master P is a good way to remember that. And it's responsible for production and distribution of hormones, which we'll talk about when we get to the endocrine system. Now, which area of the brain is essential to the formation of long-term explicit memories? Okay, and it's kind of a memorization one. Was it the pineal gland, the hypothalamus, the thalamus, hippocampus, or pituitary? And just looking at this, pineal gland, we haven't talked about. Hypothalamus is in charge of your drives. The thalamus is the relay center of the brain for all senses except smell. Hippocampus, okay, which we did talk about, and think of it this way, that's the right answer. Hippos have good memory. Okay. And again, the answer was B. Now, acidic colon appears to play a vital role in the formation of long-term memories. Okay. Acidic colon is a neurotransmitter. It is responsible to conclude that this area of the brain is most likely affected by Alzheimer's disease. Now, obviously it says acidic colon, and in the question it says memories. Which area of the brain, which that we just covered, is in charge of memories? Kind of looking at the choices, amygdala, hypothalamus, Hippocampus, corpus callosum, or thalamus. And most of you should have picked the hippocampus. Now, the limbic system is composed of several areas of the brain. And this is the hippocampus, the hypothalamus, thalamus, and amygdala. This is associated with emotion, behavior, and long-term memory formation. The limbic system is going to come up when we talk about emotions a little bit. But the limbic system, my emotions are in limbo. That's a good way to remember it. But this is simply where your emotion expression comes from. Now, this is considered to also be the limbic system, to be the pleasure center of the brain because of its production of dopamine. Dopamine, remember, is a neurotransmitter that's associated with pleasure. When you feel good, dopamine's released. So where is dopamine being released from? The limbic system, just like acetylcholine is being released from you know, the hippocampus. Now, obviously, if somebody is you know taking drugs that is associated with the limbic system. When you look at this hypothalamus, which is in charge of your hunger drive, thirst drive, and sex drive, all those drives when they're satisfied, you feel good when you eat, you feel good when you get something to drink, and so on. Now, the hippocampus obviously is a part of that, so that's why a lot of you have anytime you're hungry, you often have memories of other times that you've been hungry. You throw in the amygdala, which is emotion. That's why a lot of people obviously get upset when they're hungry or get, you know, simply, you know, very, you know, satisfied in terms of when they eat. Now, common question here. Anson Miller in 1954 concluded that which, of the, which area of the brain is responsible for producing the neurotransmitter dopamine? Dopamine, pleasure type of neurotransmitter. Limbic, okay, when you look at that, you're in limbo and thus been given the distinction of being the brain's pleasure center. Is that the limbic system, the auditory cortex, Broca's area, Wernicke's area, or the reticular activating system? And most of you, again, should have picked on this one, as we just went over it, the limbic system, letter A. Now, 
how psychologists look at the brain. Some of these are going to come back up in other chapters. EEG, for example, when we talk about states of consciousness and sleep, is going to come back up. And what an EEG does is it measures the brain activity in the brain, which that, what it will show you is when a person is really, you know, in deep sleep or a person has just fallen asleep and so on. Now, it can't measure activity deep within the brain. So each one of these that we're going to talk about, imaging the brain, does one up on the other one. So that kind of led into CAT scans or CT scans, which stands for Computed Tomography Images. And this is a two-dimensional image. It's based on an x-ray. You get a bump on the head, you're going to get a CAT scan. And it's going to show if there's a bruise or there's swelling. Now it can view, like I just said, abnormalities. Like if you did, you know, obviously hurt an area of the brain, such as a surface bruise. But you can't view the mental process of the brain. What a CAT scan is going to lead to is probably further testing. That further testing would be an MRI. MRI provides more detailed view of the soft tissue in the brain. Now, it's using a large magnetic field. It provides greater contrast within an image, so it can show a lot of times microscopic type of damage. It does expose people to a strong magnetic field, and it's not good for people that obviously are older and have pins and braces. MRI a lot of times is used when you, know, you simply just need to see a slight tear, like in a ligament or a slight you know, tissue damage in the brain. Now, Again, one step up here, the fMRI, or the Functional Magnetic Resonance Imaging, measures neural activity in the brain. Remember, neural activity is communication within the brain. So if somebody is having some type of brain abnormality where they're not able to process information, not able to function properly, you know, for example, pick up something with a hand or remember a person's name, they're going to use an fMRI. And it shows the area of the brain associated with cognitive functioning. And it measures the blood flow. Okay? Now, it doesn't show so much neural networks, in other words, connections. So a lot of times it has a hard time showing why certain people have, you know, parts of their life that they can't remember. Now, the newest one, transcranial magnetic stimulation, excites neurons. Now the purpose of exciting a neuron, or simply making a neuron fire, remember firing is an action potential, so allowing a neuron to exceed the threshold to see it fire, what that does is it shows whether you know, it's going to function on a regular basis. Now, Dr. Dolan is interested in studying short-term memory and the role of prefrontal cortex in related tests. Which of the following techniques would be most likely used to determine whether the prefrontal cortex is involved in short-term memory? Now, this is a kind of a question you got to get used to. It's a tough question, okay? Now, PET scans we haven't really talked about. EEGs show brain activity. Magnetic resonance Imaging shows you know, soft tissue damage, like tears and ligaments. A CAT scan shows an overall image of the brain, like an x-ray. And then the transcranial magnetic stimulation overexcites neurons to see how they function. Which again, I gave you the key word. When you look back at the answers, transcranial magnetic stimulation excites the neurons to see how they function, to make sure they're going to function. Now, the endocrine system is responsible for the release of hormones throughout the body. Hormones are chemical signals carried throughout the bloodstream. Remember neurons, you know, carry messages within the brain, okay? This is a chemical signal, okay? Now, it's responsible for metabolism, height, muscle growth, and puberty. Now, this is a good chart, and again, a lot of these we're going to come back to at other times. But the hypothalamus is kind of known as the master of the master gland. The hypothalamus is what connects or links. This is important to know the brain to the endocrine system. It links, so to speak, okay, the nervous system with the endocrine system. So it's the master of the master gland. What's the master gland? That's master P, the pituitary gland. Now, it manages all the other growth hormones. Okay? The penile gland, which we'll talk about when we talk about states of consciousness, it produces melatonin. Melatonin is a hormone that regulates sleep. Some of you may have heard of people having to take melatonin injections because they have problems sleeping. Thyroid, which is in the neck, controls the BMR. Right? This is the basal metabolic rate. So when we talk about the thyroid, we're going to talk about people that lose weight or people that gain weight and they have a problem with the thyroid. The adrenal, okay, which is above the kidneys, is simply producing you know, adrenaline, cortisol, and dopamine. When we talk about adrenal, we're going to talk about stress. Cortisol, just to point this out, 
acts as a stress fighter, but when it's produced, that's when people often gain weight during stressful situations. And obviously adrenaline is what it means. When people are stressed, a lot of times the release of adrenaline causes fight or flight, causes them to obviously become excited. Now, <coughs> reproductive, testosterone and estrogen, obviously those are secondary sex characteristics, which we'll talk about, but that's what gives a woman her features and a male his features. Now, common question here. Tim is 15 years old and 7 feet tall. His parents are both about 5 and a half feet tall. Tim's height is most likely due to which one of those glands is in charge of height? Penile gland, pituitary, underactive I should say, pituitary gland, overactive pituitary gland. Remember, you know, the guy's pretty tall here. Underactive thyroid gland or overactive thyroid gland. Now remember, just to kind of help you with this, penile glands produce melatonin, that's in charge of sleep. I don't think that has anything to do with this height. Thyroid's in charge of metabolism. So what's the master, you know, gland master P? And being that he's, you know, seven feet tall, the answer would be an overactive pituitary gland. Okay, pituitary gland is in charge of the growth hormone. Now, some case studies, and remember case studies are in-depth studies of unique or individuals. Phineas Gage was a railroad worker who had an accident. And basically what happened with this guy, he was a uh, tire iron, you know, basically shot into his brain. It was right to the frontal lobe. Now, this caused an ablation, the removal of tissue in the area of the brain. That's when there's damage due to some type of environmental factor. Now, Gage was able to stand up, okay, but after the accident, his personality changed. You know, the one thing was he was constantly swearing. Now, just to kind of cut it off, remember the frontal lobe is in charge of inhibition. I mean, it simply controls your impulsive behavior. So if there's damage to the frontal lobe, what this showed was he was able to get up so there was no damage to the cerebellum, which is in the hindbrain, but damage to the frontal lobe, which isolated it, which means basically other areas of the brain are still able to function. But when one area is damaged, it's obviously going to be affected. Now, a couple other terms here. A lesion is tissue damage resulting from disease, which I mentioned on that one slide. Okay. Plasticity, this is important. Change that occur in the brain due to environmental factors. When a child is born, if there was, for example, damage to a child's brain, because the brain is in a, so to speak, a plastic form, there's other areas of the brain that might be able to compensate. So if you know, a child has a near-death drowning situation, there was damage to an area of the brain, others area of the brain might be able to pick up the pieces, so to speak. Okay, that concludes our chapter. Thank you very much.